City Lit, we are proud to bring people together to enrich lives through learning. From languages to performing arts, business to humanities, visual arts to well-being, deaf education and speech therapy. City Lit, follow your passion. Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Mark Malcolmson. I'm principal of City Lit and I'm your host for this evening. Um, I know we've got people all over from the UK, but also from North America, uh, from Canada and the United States. So welcome across many time zones. Um, I am honestly delighted to host this evening. Um, so Vince Cable is um, known to so many of you for the myriad of parts of his career. Um, cabinet minister, leader of the Liberal Democrat Party, former chief economist of Shell, um, He's somebody that has packed in so much and is very much a kind of household name and very trusted in all aspects of kind of politics and economics. And for us uh, at City Lit, he is a fellow of the college. Um, he is somebody that we have recognized five years ago, somebody who's contributed a lot to adult education in this country and been a huge supporter of both the college and adult education as a whole. Um, I've had the pleasure of interviewing Vince in a number of different forums around the world, um, online most recently. Um, he did a lecture very early on for us during the lockdown about the economics of the lockdown. Um, he's been our guest around mental health and well-being. He's also talked about um, policy, economics and, and other issues that affect us so much at the college and in Britain as a whole. So. This is somebody that I, I enjoy my chats with. Um, but tonight we've got a particularly um, important thing. It's because we're helping Vince um, launch his new book. Um, amongst, as I said, the, the many other talents he has, um, he's also an author. Um, and I have in my hand a copy here. A number of you have already ordered it and you should either receive it today or tomorrow. Um, it's officially published in the United Kingdom um, on Thursday and is also being published in America and Canada um, in the next near future. Um, what we're going to do this evening, if that works for everybody, is that um, we are, Vince and I will start a conversation. It's very much for the next uh, 55 minutes, a chat between us. And um, if you want to join in, I'll, I'll get it going. And um, I know Vince has got a lot to talk about. Um, could you use the, um, the Q&A function on Zoom? And if you could keep your questions quite short, um, I'll be trying to keep an eye as they scroll. And the longer they are, the, the harder it is, especially if there's a number of you doing that. So if, you're, um, if you put them in the Q&A rather than the chat box. Um, as you can see, we have our colleague Charmaine, who is interpreting into British Sign Language for us. And thank her very much for being part of the team here. And Julie um, is also providing closed captions for um, this um, discussion. So if you want um, the closed captioning, please go down to the Zoom bar um, and press on closed captioning to activate it for yourself. So they're the kind of housekeeping rules. Um, really, Vince, welcome. Um, Thank thanks very much for joining us. and. Um, I've got quite a few questions. I want to start by kind of what inspired you to write the book in the first place? I think it's partly my own history. I mean, I spent the first uh, two or three decades of my professional life uh, as an economist in universities, government, business. And then the latter part of my career, 20 years and a bit more getting into parliament as a politician, you know, as a member of parliament and in the cabinet. And I was fascinated increasingly by this overlap between the world of economics and the world of politics, because most of the people who make decisions about economic policy, which is crucial to our you know, living standards and the way our societies function, are not economists at all. You know, you, occasionally you get one. You know, Manmohan Singh, who was Prime Minister of India, was a professional economist. Um, Earhart after the war in Germany, but not many. Most are just professional politicians or soldiers, revolution is whatever. And there's an important question about what, where they got their ideas from, because they operate in a different world from economists. They, 
got to cope with political parties and the elections and public opinion and constraints that economists don't face. I mean, you can subcontract out some of the decisions. The, you know, money policy is on a technical level dealt with by the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England. Uh, but for the most part, the big, the big decisions, the big choices are made by politicians. So that was my starting point. And then I, when I started thinking about it, it occurred to me that this is an area where individuals matter. You know, we often think of history in terms of great historical forces of one kind or another. But, you know, there is a what you might call a, a big man or sometimes a big woman theory of history. Um, and there are some individuals who sort of tower above their generation who made an enormous difference to the way economics was actually done. I mean, you know, Roosevelt in the United States, Margaret Thatcher in Britain, um, you know, Deng Xiaoping in China, who in many ways is the, you know, the giant figure in, in my book. Um, and, and these individuals made a difference. They fundamentally changed things. But they were politicians. They, were, they, weren't, they weren't economists. Brilliant. And so... You've, you've already preluded the, the fact that as you've chosen 16 leaders. How, how did you go about the actual choice of who versus who made, who's on the cutting room floor in that sense? And, and why these particular people? Uh, well, I, I, I'd like to think it was scientific, but it probably wasn't. I mean, I started with eight, actually. Um, and I did a, a university MOOC, uh, actually at Nottingham, based on those eight people. Uh, but then it occurred to me that there are other parts of the world that I haven't properly dealt with. I mean, actual Asia is the growth story of our generation, but I, I only had one, the, the, the Meiji Emperor in, in Japan. But actually what's happened in Korea, in Singapore, in China, these are important stories. Um, some, you know, somebody we've hardly really paid attention to in Britain, but Abe, who was prime minister in, in Japan until recently, introduced what was called Ab Abenomics, which was actually quite serious and has um, served as a kind of template for a lot of the things that Western politicians have done. So I, I gradually built up the list and then I realized I hadn't got anybody from India. So I had to do Nanmohan Singh, who did a great deal. Um, there are a lot of people I wasn't quite sure how to deal with. I mean, the European Union um, is, is a major economic construct. And probably in retrospect, I should have taken on somebody like Schumann political figure who helped at the launch, or even one of the people who took it to a new level, like um, Cole or Mitterrand. But um, yeah, that, that, that was a slightly arbitrary omission. But I, it, it, it grew. Um, if, if I'd kept at it, I, I'd finished up with 20 odd, probably. And the, the, the process of writing it, because for, the, for those of you in the audience who haven't had a chance to see the book yet, by the way, I'm going to, there's a kind of bit now that, of course, he'd say that because he's Vince is his guest, but I have to say it's a damn good read. Um, it's, it's, there's a very, very good introduction that kind of takes you, maps you through what's going to happen. And then each kind of person is covered in a, um, a, 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 a an essay. And it's, um, it's very well structured. So you can, I, I have to say, I said to Vince beforehand is I didn't actually do it in the order that it was written. I kind of dropped in. I desperately wanted to know about one per on. And so nobody's ever really explained why that happened and why it continues to happen in Argentina. So I went there and then I kind of went backwards. So it's, 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 there's a lovely way of each one stands alone, but there is an overarching narrative. Um, how did, when you sat down to do, you, you've made your list. Um, how did you go about dis deciding to research each individual? How much? How, how did the process work for you, Vince? Well, I read every biography I could find on the people concerned. Um, I mean, it wasn't primary research. I mean, I wasn't going through um, original letters, but there are some wonderful biographies around. You know, there's a, a great biography of of uh, Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton by Cherno and a great biography of Deng by Vogel. So they were my, you know, they were my sources. And then I gradually built up and read others and counted views. But I, I, I basically read vast numbers of kind of secondary source material to form a view about the individuals. That's how I went about it. And, and what changed during that process? I often think of, I think it was Philip Ziegler who wrote 
Mount Batten's bi uh, biography, and he had on his desk, you have to remember he was a great man. Are the, are the people that you started off thinking that were going to be your heroes, and then you sort of go, oh, actually, they're not as good as I thought. And then other people that you were probably more begrudging to, that you decided were a bit better than than your first um, first glance. Yes, there were, there were people who are sort of painted as historical baddies. And uh, the more I thought about it and read about them, I tried to think of the world through their eyes and became more better disposed to them. I, I, I suppose, you know, since I'm a kind of social democrat, I would naturally recoil against communist dictators. But actually, the more you read about Deng and his history and what he accomplished, I mean, this was a phenomenal life's work. I mean, a man who really got to grips with problems in his 70s um, and then totally transformed the way that China approached economic policy, won political battles with his colleagues. I mean, staggering, really. Um, uh, and then unleash the process that has sort of lifted China from being a rather backward, desperately poor country to being a, an economic superpower. And a lot of that is down to Deng personally and what he unleashed. Or somebody like Lenin, and I mean, I think, you know, instinctively, most of us think, you know, communist, revolutionary, brutal dictator. But actually, if you look at the end of his life, when he was beginning to look at the mistakes that they had made, and he brought in markets uh, to alleviate the effects of, you know, communist planning and, and the wartime conditions. And markets had a transformative effect on Russia at that time. Um, of course, Stalin subsequently stamped it out. Uh, but his experience with markets, it wasn't just important in Russia at the time, but it became the model for others to follow. I mean, Deng, was a student in Moscow at the, when the new economic policy was being tried after uh, Lenin had died. And he took back to China those ideas. So the couple of unfashionable individuals that I saw great merit in. And for me as a, as a British uh, politician, uh, Margaret Thatcher was always a hate figure. You know, we, I stood for Parliament against her candidates and ultimately defeated them. And she was the bogey. Um, did terrible things and so on. But but actually, when you try to be objective about her life's work in economic terms, there's lots of positives, real positives. And I think, you know, one has to acknowledge them. I think you talk about context. And what I like about each, each individual piece is that you talk about the person, the economic effects, but also the context that they're operating in, which, as I said, in, in relatively short chapters, you, you manage to capture all of those different things going on at the same point. And I think that's, that's incredibly impressive and, um, because context matters. There's the old Macmillan thing, events, my dear boy, about making great leaders. And um, you, you, if I go back to say right, right at the beginning, the first person you look at is Alexander Hamilton. Um, you know, obviously you talk about the Chernow book, which is not only an amazing biography, but it's also the inspiration. It's probably the only really serious biography that's been the source of a hip hop musical. So, I mean, um, the, the, the whole thing about him is there's so many different elements to him and almost the economic, the economist is forgotten. Um, we think about the revolutionary, all of those different pieces. So tell me why, why did you start with him? And, and how did that help you set the scene for the rest of the book? Well, where I start was a bit arbitrary. Um, modern economics um, really took shape in the 18th century. Um, you know, Adam Smith, but there were the French uh, economists of that time who had a considerable influence around Louis XIV's court. I'm not sure they're politicians in the sense that we'd understand the word. Um, but, but kind of modern economics, the, the, the modern economy and indeed modern uh, politics really, really got underway at the beginning of the 19th century and the American Revolution was a key stepping stone. Uh, and what was remarkable about Hamilton was that well, he wasn't just an extremely able intellectual who thought about you know, many ideas, not just economics. 
uh, but was the first person to grasp some ideas that we're still struggling with today. I mean, the idea of the the infant industry protection of industries still controversial today. And he thought through it in a in a much more sophisticated way that sort of Trump's people have been doing, who are applying the same policy essentially. I mean, he thought deeply about how you allocate debt between the different states of the United States. It's the same problem that the European Central Bank and European governments are thinking about today. And he did it in a very thoughtful way, which embedded the, the, the United States. Um, he set up a bank which became the central bank of the United States. All the, all the, you know, the foundation stones of modern America, he, he laid them. And, while, and he was doing that while fighting political battles. And he was a great hater and people hated him and uh, probably why he didn't become president. But, you know, he was a politician, but he was also a brilliant economic policymaker. And somebody like him, so he, he is the classic Renaissance man. He pulled in all sorts of different things because he was also one of the authors of the Constitution. He, he wasn't, he was a bit of everything, which is what's quite stunning about him. Um, but he, you're right about this, this bit of, he, he, he ultimately was in the crucible of events, the revolution, the trying to form the United States, making a country out of essentially a, a, a disparate, group of very, very, if we kind of think Germany and Greece haven't got much in common, the economies of Massachusetts and say Georgia at the time of the Declaration of Independence, they were hugely different. So he does all of that. How did you find that, you know, if you transplanted somebody like him, because I do like the fact that you, you draw historical analogies and say his challenges were the same challenges that we have with the European Union in a number of ways, and you do it as well with Bismarck. Um, do you think that in a normal time, he would have had as big an effect? Was it, would he have been somebody that, if you'd have put him down in the middle of the 1950s, which economically were fairly easygoing, would he, would he have kind of survived in that type of environment or, or prospered? I don't think the issue is easygoingness. I think the, the, the issue is that we've become much more specialist. Um, it was possible at that time to be a Renaissance man, to, to get your head around lots of different disciplines. Now we're very fragmented. And that's true of economics too. If you look at you know the, the leading economists in the world, they're, they're very highly specialized, most of them. So that, that's one big difference. But in, in many ways, he was thoroughly modern. I mean, what he did uh, was to employ evidence-based decision-making, which is what uh, we preach about in our governments today. For example, he decided that it would probably be a good idea to promote manufacturing in America, which had virtually none. So his first step was to write letters to hundreds of people around the world to gather their opinions on how this should be done uh, and, and, you know, positives and negatives. And he looked at all the letters and came to conclusions. I mean, that, that's how we want people to make decisions now. And he, it wasn't just the decisions he made, it was how he made them that was so impressive. And if you think the, the way that he set the United States in its direction, it's funny that you do, I don't know if it was a deliberate device, but you end, of course, with Donald Trump, which I'd like to talk about a bit before. And that kind of bookending of kind of your first person right the way through. Another great hater, I have to say, in terms of, of the, pol the politician side. But um, do you think that America, did Hamilton set it on such a good course that economically it was, was more likely to prosper as a, you know, that binding force economically? Helped Absolutely. And it wasn't obvious that it would have happened without him. I mean, you know, some people take the view that there are kind of, there's an historical inevitability to a lot of things. That's, that's not actually the case. Um, I mean, he, he argued for, I mean, he was one of the earliest abolitionists. One of the reasons he, he loathed people like Jefferson uh, was, was he'd come from the Caribbean, you know, absolutely hated slavery. But he actually made an intellectual case against it on economic grounds. This is a terribly bad way to develop a country, to be reliant on, um, you know, natural resources and, you know, slaves. I mean, he, he understood that 
uh, to prosper, a country's got to develop its um, innovation, its uh, its education, and, and you don't do that on a slave-based economy. And so he argued it both on moral and practical economic grounds, and he, uh, you know, built the platform for the, you know, the subsequent uh, federalist case in, in America. Yeah. And uh, just to move on a little bit around another nation forming person. So we think of Bismarck um, in the, the formation. Everybody, whoever in this audience did O level history, there was always the questions on Bismarck's foreign and Bismarck's domestic policy. And that you would always hope that you're with the year that it was foreign policy because it was much easier to actually kind of elucidate. Well, you've done the that the, the, there's a very big nod to the foreign policy about the wars, et cetera. But you, you really make a very interesting case about Bismarck, the, the economics guy. Um, so do you want to talk about that a little bit and then yes, yes. bring it forward to the EU? Because so many of those pr challenges he faced are almost textbook for EU. Well, he wasn't a very, um, you know, appetizing individual in some ways. I mean, he was described by the King of Prussia as the most reactionary member of a reactionary class. Um, you know, wh when you need to kill people is the guy you, you, you turn to. Um, so he, he wasn't very, he was very reactionary, rather nationalistic and, you know, ultimately in, in the German sense. And actually he wasn't interested in economics, um, but there were, there were the three big issues which he confronted. The first was German unification. And in order to get unification going, it had to have an economic base. So he built on the Zollverein, which is a kind of customs union, um, building up an external tariff and internal free trade, which is really what the European common market subsequently has been all about. So he, he developed the Zollverein. He understood why it was important. Uh, then he did a, a U-turn on the basic issue of free trade and protectionism. He was a, a rabid free trader because that was where the kind of more conservative liberals of his generation were. Uh, and then he was persuaded, um, partly because of the potential of, of industry for armaments, um, but, but more generally of the merits of um, developing manufacturing and using tariffs to do so. So he, he actually put into practice uh, that, that whole idea of um, protected industry, which became the model subsequently in Japan, in Korea and, and elsewhere. And then lastly, although he was a deeply reactionary man, he hated socialist socialism, everything to do with it. He was a sufficient of a realist to understand that he had to make an accommodation uh, with the kind of working class organizations led by the Social Democrats in Germany, who were at that point Marxist. Uh, and so he um, implemented the first world's first welfare state. And I don't think he particularly liked it, but he realized the political necessity of doing it. And the whole concept of insure, social insurance, which we brought into Britain, you know, beverage and so on, um, it was really developed, first of all, uh, by Bismarck in Germany. So he, he laid the foundation stones for a lot of the, the core ideas of kind of modern economic policy. It's interesting you say that there's some people that, you know, he was a begrudging economist, the way you paint him, that it, he, was, he wasn't that interested in it per se, but it was something, it was a necessary evil to achieve the unification of Germany and then put, make, to be the superpower that he wanted it to be, he needed to have the economics right. Whereas a number of your other people kind of gravitate first to the economics because that's where their natural kind of comfort level are. I mean, who would you say kind of fits into that category of that kind of begrudging economist of the others that you, you wrote about? Um, well, I, I guess Margaret Thatcher was a bit like that. I mean, that wasn't her first uh, sort of area of interest, but uh, she became um, what drove her. I mean, you realize this when you, when you read, you know, her thoughts that, uh, at the time, uh, b b became passionately driven by um, Hayek's ideas around personal freedom, um, and, and she objected to socialism not 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 because of an e economist reason that it's inefficient and you get distortions in markets and so on. It was because it was immoral, fundamentally immoral, and 
Uh, and of course, that was Hayek's approach to the problem. And that gave her a kind of impetus and drive, which the, the more arid um, uh, free market supporters completely lacked. So, I mean, she was somebody who came to this uh, indirectly rather than directly, but of course, it was massively transformative. It's, uh, it's interesting. So you, um, you mentioned Lenin before, and I thought um, it was interesting of, of choosing Lenin over Stalin. Again, you had to make choices, etc. I tend to think that, you know, you, if you think of Soviet, the Soviet Union, the five year plans, all of Stalin's kind of huge effect on the country and the economy of the country. Tell us a little bit again, the, the, why Lenin and not Stalin and why the, the interesting pieces that you found when you were looking into him? Uh, well, I, th I thought Lenin was interesting because despite his, um, you know, very doctrinaire way of looking at the world, uh, he looked at the world theoretically. And when you look at his before the Russian Revolution, he didn't write anything uh, of practical usefulness about how you run a communist economy. It was all very abstract jargon. Um, when he got into office and they'd experimented with um, war communism, um, he had sufficient flexibility of mind to realize that markets actually matter and they're useful uh, and can, you can develop this sort of hybrid idea of state capitalism, which is what he did. And I thought it was an extraordinarily impressive um, you know, intellectual feat and a real practical value. Uh, so Stalin, of course, I mean, quite apart from being a, you know, a monster, uh, killed tens of millions of people. I mean, he did actually have a very clear economic theory, which is that the way countries have to develop is by squeezing a surplus out of uh, the peasants, the, uh, the rural poor, and using that surplus to invest heavily in industrialization through which you get economies of scale and, and you, you, you build up your economy. Uh, and in many ways, you know, post-war economies like, you know, Korea is a good example, have, have employed, you know, elements of the, the kind of Stalinist way of thinking. But of course, in, in Soviet Union, it didn't work, I mean, it, quite apart from the, 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 the horrors of um, the killing and so on. As an economic policy, it ultimately failed because the the investment was so inefficient. I was just, um, I mean, it's interesting. I, di I didn't realize I was reading a, a Roosevelt biography recently, that actually he kind of, Roosevelt came into power same time as Hitler. Um, and I never really thought the two in parallel in terms of dealing with economies in absolute turmoil. You, Roosevelt, I think is fascinating from a whole series of levels because Obviously, he's the only president that's gone and been elected four times. But he has this 12 year span that nobody else has done before or since. And he is the wartime president that we think of towards the end. But then he's the guy who inherits the, the, the enormous mess of the American economy in 1933. Um, and, and, you know, talk to me about his methodology and how, because he really, he came in with the events. I mean, you know, you can draw the parallels with Joe Biden coming into massive inbox. Talk to me about how you think he, he kind of handled all of that. Well, I think the first point is that, of course, he was dealing with an economic challenge that was far bigger than we would get our heads around today. I mean, the, uh, the British economy contracted by 10% last year. Uh, the United States was less. Um, but, you know, certainly over 5%. Now, in, after the Great Crash in 1929, the American economy contracted by 30%, a different order of magnitude. And, of course, you had millions uh, of unemployed. Um, and these, you know, camps around cities, Hoovervilles, as they were called, of people who were, you know, homeless and jobless and, and very hungry. I mean, it was a, a far more critical situation than we have today. Um, I mean, he, the, the reason I chose him was because it's become very fashionable to use the word new, new deal in front of every bit of um, modern radical economics. Uh, and the idea somehow is that this is synonymous with Keynesian economics. Uh, what, what's interesting about Roosevelt, he wasn't a Keynesian at all. I mean, initially, he, his main attack line on the Republicans was that they spent too much money and that they had 
unbalanced budgets. And it, it took a long time, I think about five years, before he was eventually persuaded by the so-called American Keynesians, uh, like Hansen and Curry, that actually that was the way economics should go. It, he did an enormous amount. I mean, the New Deal was a massive program, but it actually and it had little to do with deficit financing. It was a uh, you know, large-scale government intervention. It was making things happen. It was strengthening workers' rights, breaking up monopolies. But it wasn't Keynesian economics. And he, you know, he didn't want to see Keynes. He didn't see had anything particularly interesting to say. So that in in a way, although Roosevelt was a heroic figure and did a phenomenal amount, of course, um, you know, great legacy. Uh, it wasn't for the reason that he's lionized today. And, and somehow, you know, the Keynesians of the modern era have sort of clambered on his um, bandwagon. But, but it, he actually operated in a very different way. I have to say, I, I, I think what's always underestimated about him is he would just experiment. He, would, he, he was actually intellectually quite promiscuous. He'd give something a go if it didn't work. It was that constant sense of movement, of trying things. So, you know, the, the idea he was dogmatic and doctrinaire is, is, is quite wrong. Certainly for the first three or four years, it was multiple iterations of trial and error. And also going back to your question, of course, he was much less successful than, than Hitler in dealing with unemployment. Um, you know, we, we now think of Roosevelt of having solved the interwar unemployment problem, but actually he precipitated a recession in 36, 37, when he tightened the screws uh, on fiscal and monetary policy at the wrong time. And it was really a wartime rearmament that got America back to work. Yeah. Um, slightly uncomfortable conclusion. Whereas in Germany, um, the, the sort of massive uh, program by um, Hitler's economic advisors um, were, was very, very successful, you know, and they did do Keynesian economics. And it's interesting, we, we, it's always been very hard for people to talk about Hitler's economic policies. I think a lot of people kind of shy away from it because if you look at the 1930s, Germany was quite successful. And if you think about the, the mess of Britain and the, mess, the United States and you know, France, it, um, Germany pulls itself into the point where it can launch a horrific war in a way that's on a, on a quite a sustainable economic base. And uh, I think it's fascinating just to, to, as you juxtapose what goes on during that era. Um, it's interesting you also make a nod towards um, Hitler, Mussolini, Franco when you talk about Peron. And, and how he is quite enamored, particularly with Mussolini. Um, have you any thoughts around that kind of, that triumvirate of um, Hitler, Mussolini and, and Franco? Well, there is a, a kind of economic legacy, what you could loosely call the economics of fascism, which because of the way the Second World War uh, turned out, um, nobody wanted to own. I mean, it was sort of totally discredited. Um, and the dictatorships that were left behind in Spain and, and Portugal were so insular and so stagnant in many ways that nobody wanted to look at what they were doing. Uh, but, but actually, there was a, you know, however nasty fascism was, there, there was a sort of economic thinking behind it. Um, it. It was a kind of economic nationalism. It was, you know, treating business and... Uh, unions, uh, the labor force, as part of the state. Uh, and th that was the kind of mental um, map that Peron had when he came to power after the Second World War. He was influenced very, very strongly by the economics of fascism. Uh, and he tried to put it into practice and initially was quite successful. But of course, what, what's happened you know, throughout his career and his successes was that he resorted to the printing press and um, populist gestures and his wife had an inordinate influence, uh, mostly rather unfortunate in economic terms. Uh, and, uh, you know, by the time he'd left office, um, Argentina was an economic ruin. And it, but it, what's fascinating, I love the chapter on Peron. Uh, I, I think it's my favourite in the book um, because it kind of gets to the, the bit that I've never been able to understand. It goes, so Peronism was 
after 10 years, discredited, a bit of a disaster. He is sent into exile. And yet you've had six Peronist leaders since then. It's the Argentinian keeps on keep keep on going back to it. And you talk about that. And and I think I think it is fascinating. You think it, it's not something that you'd really kind of want to emulate. It, it isn't. And the cumulative effect has been that Argentina was um, time of the First World War, a very rich country. I mean, it was really on a par with our, with Australia and Canada and probably should have finished up like them today. Uh, but has um, gone backwards, um, certainly stagnated, probably gone backwards. Um, and, and it's because of this uh, endless repetition of kind of populist economics um, that, that very often presidents come in with, with not all kind of good intentions uh, and then they they can't resist um, running massive deficits on the budget, monetizing the deficit, running up rapid inflation, uh, which then leads to a currency crisis. And then somebody has to come in and clear up the mess. And then they do austerity for some time. And then they get bored with that or they lose popularity. So they try the populist thing all over again. And you go round and round in this circle. And it does lead to ask the question about why populism had such a hold and it of course it does today in some countries um, but certainly particularly in Latin America um, and, and one of the factors which I drew attention to that um, you might think this is controversial was that was that the Catholic Church of course has this uh, profound belief in social justice uh, and Perron's party is the just you know the justissimo party the party of justice uh, and a lot of it is drawn from, from Catholic uh, teaching. And of course, you now have a, an Argentine Pope who is part of that tradition and had his bishoprics under Peronist presidents. And so there's a kind of relationship between the two that I think has been a bit lost sight of. And it's interesting because I've just got a question for Lena um, about where democracy and economic theory kind of, where they intermesh. I'm paraphrasing here, but it's... it's um, the, the the some of the people that you have talked about have prospered and thrived in in democracies. Some are autocrats, some are fascists, and, or in one form or another. Um, you do, you in the the parent chapter you talk about Pinochet, despite his odious nature of his government, was a lot more successful economically because he could get away with things because being um, a dictator. So how does how does it all interplay? Yes, I toyed with having a chapter on that, but I thought my friends would finally give up on me if I, if I gave him any sort of credibility because he's become such a bogeyman. But, but actually, the, um, although he was a monster and you know, enormous numbers of people tortured and a terrible regime, um, the economic policies, although they were widely criticized at the time, uh, the so, you know, so-called Chicago School of Economics, which was employed, did have the effect of stabilizing Chile and creating a platform within which, you know, a decade or two after Pinochet had left, you got social democratic uh, presidents being elected. Uh, you know, there are problems with Chile, and the, the quite extreme inequalities. Um, you've had the riots in the last year or so, but it's now one of the OECD countries. It's our, you know, part of the rich world in a way that Argentina isn't. Uh, and some of that goes back to the uh, financial disciplines that were, were, were built in at that time. But if you, you wanted to pick an example of how I've been a bit cowardly and avoided um, uh, <laughs> saying nice things about people I shouldn't say nice things about, uh, that, that was probably an example. And, and understandable. I mean, it's, it is interesting about that, how you, you share those things. Is is If you look at, there's a group I would characterize and correct me if i'm wrong on um, the the, the air hearts the lee kuan yu's the parks the nation state creator the, the kind of post-war period people who take often countries either in economic ruin like um south korea or germany and um and create something out of them um is there a common theme there things that that kind of you could look to to say, well, actually, there's a thread that all the ones that got it right did right, and then the other ones didn't. 
Well, that that is a common thread, but in other respects, they were utterly different. Um, I mean, Earhart was was your genuine economic liberal, who believed, you know, as a matter of faith in economic liberalism. I mean, throughout the 30s, he sort of kept his nose clean. He didn't do anything to upset the Nazis too much. But he, in his intellectual world, uh, he was um, working with a group of uh, people who ultimately be called the Mount Pelerin economic liberals, the big influence after the war, leading into Thatcherism, incidentally. Um, and Earhart was part of that school, and he was looking for an opportunity to apply free market economics in the, in the, in the cause of rebuilding Germany, and he did, and it was a brilliantly successful. Um, Park on it was, was absolutely the opposite. Uh, he, he was a really interesting guy who, despite the fact that Korea had been um, traumatized by the Japanese, had a, a Japanese name. Uh, he'd been honored by the emperor. He was sort of himself in some ways as Japanese, um, but somehow survived. We think he was probably a communist spy at one point, uh, was sentenced to death, somehow escaped from it, and became head of chief top of the army in South Korea in the most turbulent times and then took over the country in a coup d'etat. And his years uh, in charge of the military in Korea was the point at which you know, Korea was transformed from being one of the poorest countries on earth uh, to be one of the most successful economies in the post-war era. You know, Korea, like, like us, is it's not a rich country um, uh, and a social democracy in some ways. But it was Park who laid the foundations, made a lot of very controversial decisions in promoting industry against the advice he got from uh, the Americans who were putting a lot of aid into the country, uh, but, but totally transformed um, the country, um, but did it in an authoritarian way, unlike the liberal way of, of Erhard. That's fascinating. I mean, interesting, somebody, as Sally's put in the, the chat, that... Um... You're talking about Argentina, about the, the Catholic social teaching, but is also true to some degree in, in post-war German and Austrian social market form of capitalism and how we're not just talking about economics and politics, but we're also talking about, as you say, religion and, and social construct as well. Yes, but there is, a, there is a confusion over language, and that's why in many ways Erhardt's an interesting figure. Uh, Erhardt was the leader of a, a movement in economic thinking, which was called social market. Uh, but in German, and in, in his terms, this is about the free market. Nothing to do with Blairism and mixed economies and social democracy. We now call it social, uh, the social market or market socialism. But he, me he meant something utterly different. Uh, what he did do was that in order to stay in power, he allied himself to Adenauer, who was the leader of the um, German conservatives, who was predominantly Catholic, the Christian Democrats, Merkel's party. And they created this um, modern idea of the social market, which is combining capitalism with the welfare state. Erhardt was bitterly opposed to that. He just wanted free market economics. Right. It's, can we, um, I'm, I'm conscious where I've, I've got so many more questions and I'm getting some coming through. Is, is I can't shy away from the fact that your, your last person is Donald Trump. And I, I think what makes me laugh is, is, is the fact that you've been far more lucid explaining Trump's economic policies than I've ever heard Donald Trump be. Is, is, explain why you've decided to include him and explain what you think Trump's now legacy, because obviously you you finished the book saying he's now out of power. What 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 do you think um, the the economic legacy, irrespective of all the other legacies he he leaves? Well, I had questions in my mind about whether I should have included him or not. Um, uh, partly because at the time I wrote it, I thought he probably would lose, and then he would just disappear. But of course, he hasn't disappeared. <laughs> um, but what, what I think what's important is, that although, although in many respects, um, you know, what he's done, particularly at the end, it's so um, completely unconscionable um, that we don't listen to anything he might have said. But actually, in the economic uh, sphere, um, he, he broke with tradition, the kind of free trading tradition which had operated pretty much since Roosevelt after the war. 
um, and turned America in a strongly protectionist direction. Uh, and not only that, but he took the, the rest of American politicians with him. Um, there is one area where uh, Biden and the Democrats are absolutely 100% in step with Trump, and that was on trade policy and higher tariffs, particularly um, the, the trade war with China. Um, you know, very much one of the first things Biden's done is this Buy America Act. So the highly protectionist piece of legislation that's going to cause enormous friction with, with Europe, amongst other things. But this is pure Trumpism. Um, so t Trumpism was really two things, uh, Trumponomics. Uh, the first was he, he took forward a lot of the ideas from the Reaganites. Um, you know, this idea that what really matters is cutting, cutting taxes. Um, don't worry too much about the deficit and debt, but cut taxes, particularly taxes on the rich. Uh, and the theory that, you know, the so-called Laffer curve, that this is going to produce more revenue uh, and you know, more economic activity. So that was part of it. Uh, but the other half was economic nationalism, America first, tariffs, protection. And that is a decisive break with the past, and it appears to be a permanent one. So the, you think, actually, it's interesting you say that some of his legacy has already been incorporated into kind of the, the Democrats' agenda. Um, and it'll be, where, where do you see, so the, the rise of protectionism generally around the world, do you think that is something that is going to be inevitable over this coming decade, or is it something that uh, it might have just been an instant in the wind over the last few years? Well, there have been growing signs that this was um, the, the mood uh, going back I think several years before Trump, because the the, the round of uh, world negotiations, the so-called Doha, Doha round, collapsed in the earlier part of the decade. And it was partly the United States, but it was partly, this was before Trump, um, and partly India, who sort of eventually put the spoke in at the end. Um, so that there has been this growing mood, a sort of disenchantment with globalization and, and free trade and questioning the merits of it. I think I view mistaken, but, but that, that's been a, a growing mood. And, and of course, when Trump came in, he, he gave populist language to give this real, real momentum. Um, will it continue? Well, I think to the credit of the European Union, they haven't really gone along this road. Uh, there was a period some decades ago when uh, People talked about the European Union becoming a fortress and having high tariffs and using the common market agricultural policy as a protectionist device. It doesn't really happen, uh, partly because of British influence. Uh, you know, we kept kept it outward looking, um, and that seems to be the broadly the mood. Um, the Japanese are um, have traditionally had a rather protectionist approach to their economy, but uh, are wanting to liberalise. Uh, the key country, of course, is China, um, uh, and if the United States and China proceed with this uh, new Cold War, as it suggested, that means more trade barriers, more obstruction to um, supply chains, um, and that, you know, it's going to make us poorer, but, you know, it depends whether you accept that security considerations take precedence over economics. If you have, of the, of the 16 you chose, do you have a kind of personal hero? Do you think there's, there's one person that is, is the, 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 the standout for you in terms of the circumstances and what, how they responded and achieved and their legacy? Well, I think, well, there are two really, and they're, they're the, 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 the two people who tried to turn around the prospects of the two Asian giants. Uh, not many people in this country have heard of Manmohan Singh, uh, who took over. He was a very quiet, modest, self-effacing economic advisor to Mrs. Gandhi, originally in India. Um, but he was taken up at a time of economic crisis um, when the IMF had a program in India and implemented a series of reforms which, taken together, you know, really pushed India forward. I and mean, there were some years earlier this century when India was growing faster than China. Uh, it was really motoring. I mean, his government eventually sank under the weight of 
uh, Indian political factionalism and reputations for corruption. It wasn't him, he was a completely honest man. But, but you know, within that extraordinary democracy, so big, so complex, he actually managed to get things done, um, deliver things, um, using good economics. I mean, he really understood economic uh, matters um, and used the, the powers that he had that are limited to really make a difference to people's lives. So that's, that's heroic in my view. Uh, and Deng in China, again, I mean, he was, a, you know, in some ways, a brutal dictator. He believed passionately in the one-party state and not relax, relaxing Communist Party control. You could argue that he was responsible for the Tiananmen Square massacres. He gave the final orders. But what he did in terms of economic and social change and lifting the living standards of hundreds of millions of people, you know, does, I think, by any definition, take him into the world of heroes. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a morally ambiguous um, proposition, but I would definitely put him there. That's fine. I think your your point. The, the economics is often kind of seen as dry. It's it's seen as kind of yeah. It's for the wonks and the policy thing, but. The way you just described it, I think, is fascinating because it's the the, the the ability to change many, many lives for the better, or in the case of some people, and you, before we came on kind of for the, the, the talk, we were talking about the kleptocracies, the Mugabes, the um, Chavezes of the world of where they destroy a country economically. But the flip side, as you say, is the ability to lift tens, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty well, that is a pretty amazing thing for somebody to be able to do or somebody to lead a movement that is able to do that. Yes. Um, one of my regrets is that amongst my, I didn't have an African amongst my country. And that's partly because the economic history of Africa in the last half century has been so dire. Uh, but there are, there are success stories. I mean, a really interesting case, probably I, you know, if I did a future volume to include him, was Saretsi Karma who was the leader of Botswana. You know, Botswana was you know, a very poor African country, but it had mineral wealth. And what he did was instead of uh, allowing the country to go, as so many countries, the Congo, the rest of them, into kleptocracy and, and, and theft, um, he used the wealth of the minerals of Botswana in a very carefully controlled way uh, to keep a country, well, democratic, peaceful, um, distributed wealth, promoted development. You know, Botswana is a, is actually one of the real economic success stories, and perhaps he should be up there as somebody should be uh, applauded. Just finally, as we kind of wrap up, it's nearly at the top of the hour, but I I think there's a number of questions come through, and and they're they're a bit plaintive. It's like, okay, so what can we learn from Britain for all of this? Um, we're at a, a very unusual point in history, both having decided to do Brexit and then also having to deal with the, the economic ramifications of the pandemic. Um, I, I, I struggle to see that your next edition will have um, Boris Johnson at the bottom of it as, as a, a great economic leader. But if you, and you've obviously been in great positions of power in terms of the coalition and stuff, is is there advice that you've gleaned from these people that you'd be, if you were on in the cabinet now, be saying, go and read your history, look what this, this guy did and made a difference? Yes, I think what's missing, um, and I'm not trying to make a party political point here, is that I, I think that at the moment there's a complete absence of strategic thinking. Um, yet so many of the characters I dealt with, including you know in this country, Margaret Thatcher is a very good example. I had a very clear strategic view about where they were trying to go. Um, and you know, the motivation may have been complex and the mixtures of economics and politics, but it was strategic. It had an eye on the long term. Whereas at the moment, we seem to be drifting from one thing to the other. Um, I mean, you know, Brexit's happened. There's no point rehearsing all the arguments there. But, you know, there there is a, you know, if, it could be that somebody taking a, a very strategic view could make something out of the global Britain idea um, if we, you know, we, we had some kind of sensible long term plan building on the industrial strategy, you know, getting, you know, business investing over a 10, 20 year time arising and dealing with issues like 
the lack of training and, and you know, adult education and dealing with these things systematically and long term, you know, could really do something with this country. But I, I, I don't see that kind of approach happening. It's very opportunistic, very short term. So they but your your agenda, your your kind of investment and the long term thinking is probably a very good good point to lead on. There are there are leave on there is a number of things that we could be doing better, and that's that's good to aspire to. Um, I am conscious that we've kind of zipped through the hour very fast. Um, I'd, I'd really like to thank Vince for giving us his time, as he has done many, many times at City Lit, and you can understand why we're very proud to have him as a fellow of the college. Um, I know quite a few of you have already bought a copy of the book. Um, I'm doing my promotional bit now, um, and I can thoroughly recommend it. I think it's a cracking book. And whether it's something you read in a wanna with all the different bits or you dip into, as I did, at reading different chapters in different orders, I think it's, um, it's you know, if you really did want to see that nexus and intersection between money and power, then um, I recommend it thoroughly. Um, uh, there is, I think, Sam has put in, my colleague has put in um, the chat box, um, there are, a you, you, number of you have ordered the book already. Some of you have got the chance to kind of get it. Also, obviously, through all good booksellers as of Thursday. And um, in the meantime, I'd like to thank Charmaine and Julie for doing the interpreting and the captioning. Vince, thank you very much. Um, good luck with the book. Um, I know it will um, do well. Thank you. All right, everybody. Have a lovely evening, everyone. And we'll also probably be sending an email out tomorrow just with the details of the book so that you can make sure that you get it. All right. Um, thank you, Vince. We won't walk off stage as we would do if we were in the college. We will now kind of the, the plug will be pulled on us, but really appreciate you being part of this. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.